Hi everyone, Felix here. Would you like to join us here at Camp Myth? Show us how you're enjoying the story so far, and our favourite entry will entitle the winner to join Moxie, Argy and me, Felix, in a future Camp Myth story. Any type of entry is fine. Drawings, stories, poems, photographs. How about a video of you singing Centaur Races? Submit them by December the 31st of this year, 2013, to campmyth at castofwonders.org. Hope to see you. This is Cast of Wonders, the young adult fiction podcast featuring stories of the fantastic. Welcome to Camp Myth. Chapter 12, December 11th, 2013. Welcome back, campers. Are you ready for our next chapter? Last week, our trio of campers dove into their Camp Myth training handbooks and concocted a plan to earn their first merit badge. The sun's up, campers. Let's see how they're doing, shall we? Now, where were they? Oh, yes. Camp Myth, Phoenix Watching, by Chris Lewis Carter, Chapter 12 This is what I get, Archie shouted as the three of us trampled down a forest path with our heads ducked between our elbows. This is exactly what I get for trusting you two. Don't even start with me, Argy. Moxie snapped back as a trio of blades zipped past her tail. You're the one who blew the stupid whistle. As planned, I'd slipped out of bed just before dawn and met Moxie and Argy in front of the forgotten forest hiking trails. What wasn't planned was how, less than 15 minutes into our hike, Argy concluded that the strange whistle on his myth army knife was probably a bird call. Well, he was right. Except there wasn't a phoenix and he managed to attract. Instead it was a wild Stymphalian bird, a flesh-eating vulture with a bronze beak and razor-sharp metallic feathers that could launch like tiny missiles. We have to get out of the open! We're sitting ducks out here, I yelled as two more feathers blazed past me and wedged deep inside a tree. We pushed through a tangle of branches to a less travelled section of the trail that had far more overgrowth amongst the treetops. The Stymphalian, now with less room to manoeuvre, decided to stop wasting its plumage and simply dive-bombed us instead. We threw ourselves to the ground just as it swooped down and snapped its beak with a loud clang, barely missing the top of my left ear. The bird arched out of its dive and pitched on an overhead limb, leering at us with cold steel eyes. It looked as though it was about to make another attack when, out of nowhere, a pair of scaly hands shot down from a higher branch and seized the creature by the neck. With a panicked shriek, the Stymphalian was jerked out of sight. It cried once more, then fell silent. All three of us stayed put, not daring to move an inch in fear that we would attract whatever monster would snack on a bird with bladed feathers. After a minute or so had passed, though, it looked as though the threat was over. Even a raccoon casually trotted past us and disappeared into the brush. Psst! That must have been a basilisk! Moxie whispered. I read about And if it's not, Argy asked, in that case, I don't need to outrun it. I just need to outrun you. As if to prove her point, Moxie got to her feet and raised her arms. See? Not interested. We both stood up, still panting heavily from our mad dash through the forest. Ah, uh, come on, you two, Moxie said. Don't tell me you're tired already. For your information, I've started working out, I said. <laughs> well, it isn't working out, he quipped. Argy laid his pack on the ground, then took a step back to survey the treetops. No phoenix in its right mind is going to build a nest in basilisk territory. We need a plan. If you were a phoenix, where would you go? I have some thoughts on that. Moxie opened her handbook to a trail guide for the Forgotten Forest. Before our little whistle incident, I was leading us to this clearing right uh, here. She tapped the page with one long pointed fingernail. There's a ravine nearby where a phoenix could gather rocks, and a stream where it could catch fish. I'm not sure how far we've gone off course, but I'd still guess it's no more than a few hundred yards away. Follow me. 
We headed deeper into the forest, so much that only thin slivers of sunlight filtered through the tree line. Our steps were marked with snapping twigs and the percussion of countless leaves. It was actually pretty peaceful until Argy tripped over a gnarled root and stumbled headlong into an alder thicket. Oh, why couldn't there have been a batch for sitting quietly? He said, fighting his way back onto the narrow path. Hey, look at that. Argy pointed to a nest that was hanging upside down from a branch. Sitting inside, contentedly clinging to the twigs, was a rainbow-coloured bird. That's an ooslem, I said, having tracked down its picture in the MYTH. It says here that it's also the only bird that flies backwards. It does so because, while it doesn't know where it's going, it likes to know where it's been. Suddenly, a dull rumble echoed throughout the forest. The Uslum's tiny eyes grew wide. It dropped out of the nest and began to fly in tight backward circles. Faster and faster it flew until it formed a tiny spiral of light, then disappeared. What the... Where did it go? Argy said, inspecting the area around the nest. The handbook also says that an Uslum is capable of vanishing if it feels threatened. But we weren't going to hurt it. Argy whined. What was it so afraid of? As if in answer to his question, a bolt of lightning shot down from the sky and struck the nest, reducing it to a pile of ashes. All three of us jumped back and looked to the treetops, where a large bird roughly the size of an eagle was staring down at us from an overhead branch. It had blue and yellow feathers and two small curled horns growing from the top of its head. Electricity crackled behind its eyes. It flapped its wings and another dull rumble echoed through the trees. I'd read a little about this creature the night before, but I didn't think we'd actually encounter one. Um, guys, that's a thunderbird, I said. We must have accidentally wandered into its territory. Moxie glanced my way. And it can shoot lightning? From its eyes, yeah. We should probably get out of here then. I'd say so. I took a step back and the thunderbird launched a bolt of lightning that struck the ground where I'd just been standing. It tilted its head to the side and surveyed us with its electric gaze. Uh, what, 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 what are we supposed to do now? Argy said, his voice quivering. It's not letting us leave. I considered drawing my myth army knife, but decided against it. Any suspicious movement might end up sending another bolt my way. Besides, I wasn't sure what attachment, if any, would be useful in a situation like this. We really should have waited until after the training seminar before we started wandering off the main trails. There is something we can do. Well, something I can do. Moxie said. On the count of three, you both run as fast as you can. What about you, I asked. Just do it, okay? She took a deep breath. One, two, three. There was a loud crack and Moxie vanished, replaced by the red and white fox I'd last seen barreling down Lil's vine. The Thunderbird squawked, then fired a blast of lightning in her direction, but Moxie was far too agile in her current form. She scampered across the ground, dodging bolt after bolt from the enraged creature until she disappeared into the brush. With another thunderous clap, the bird flapped its wings and flew off in pursuit of his new prey. Go! Moxie's telepathic voice rattled through my skull. Argy must have heard her this time too because he flinched in surprise, then turned and ran faster than I'd ever seen him move. I was right behind him though, and together we fought through the densely woven foliage until the trees gave way to a small clearing where the forest floor was dotted with dozens of jagged stumps. We both stopped to catch our breath, and Argy took another puff of his inhaler. Do you... you think... We lost it, he said between gasps. Looks that way, I said. I just hope Moxie's okay. Me too. A few seconds later, we heard a rustling noise from across the clearing and Moxie emerged from the trees. She was back in her regular form, taking small shaky steps and her eyes were wide with fright. Moxie, are you okay? I said. Did you take care of it? She shook her head and jerked a thumb over her shoulder. Not exactly. And that's when another creature stalked into the clearing beside Moxie, the thunderbird hanging limply from its jaws. (laughs) 
This week's camper spotlight is on Eris and Millie. Felix says, "As far as Faye go, Eris is the toughest girl I've ever met." Everyone laughed when her best friend Millie the Kitsune said they had just caught a giant sea monster. But I should have known she wasn't cracking jokes. Humans love puns, right? Oh, Felix. Eris and Millie were invented by Gregory Bernal. You can find the picture of them on the Camp Myth webpage. Cast of Wonders could use your help. We love to bring you free stories every week, but without you, it's just not possible. Please consider donating at castofwonders.org, where you'll find PayPal buttons for regular and one-time donations. Or you can help spread the word about us and our projects and our weekly stories by blogging or tweeting, writing us a review on iTunes, or liking our Facebook page. There's lots of ways you can show your love for our tales of the fantastic. Camp Myth Phoenix Watching is a Cast of Wonders production brought to you by Wolfsbane Publishing and featuring the voice talents of Kate Baker, Adam Black, Tina Connolly, Graham Dunlop, Christiana Ellis, Marguerite Kenner, Alethea Contas, Alistair Stewart, Ian Stewart, and Barry J. Northern. You can learn more about the world of Camp Myth at our website, castofwonders.org. Our weekly episodes are released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives License. Please don't change it or sell it, but we'd love it if you'd share it. The Camp Myth theme music, August, is by our favorite musical artist Alexi Nov from MusicAlley.com. Thanks for listening.